بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to Talking with Teachers. I'm your host, Dr. Abdullah bin Hamid Ali. And today we have a very special guest, Sheikh Yasser Fahmi. Sheikh Yasser Fahmi graduated from Rutgers Business School. And after working for a number of years in finance, he moved to Egypt, where he studied for eight years at Azhar University. In his time at Azhar, he attained numerous ijazats and uh, studied under many noble, notable teachers, including Sheikh Ahmed Taha Rayyan, and in 2013, Sheikh Yasser Fahmi became the first American Azhari to teach in the renowned Al Azhar Mosque. Now, Sheikh Yasser um, is one of my favorite khatibs. Uh, you know, he uh, we we hear his voice quite a bit in my house. Uh, my wife sees constantly watching, of course, his his talks. In addition to others uh, like him, uh, Sheikh Yasser um, is a, a very good friend, um, a very good person, uh, a wonderful person, and. And hopefully we have a very uh, good conversation with him. So we all can bring to the screen. Sheikh Yasser Fahmi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Sheikh. How are you? Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullah. How are you having me? Well, alhamdulillah. It's really good to, to have the opportunity to speak to you today. I really thank you for agreeing to take part in this uh, this podcast. No, it's my, my my pleasure as always, alhamdulillah. And it's any any time to spend with you is always a blessing. And uh I just wish I wish we had more time to do that. You know, it's yeah, uh, yeah. I haven't seen you in person in like a pretty long time. But since well, inshallah, inshallah. yeah, we definitely gonna gonna have to remedy that. You know, um yes. I actually haven't seen um much of my family on the East Coast since 2019. I, I wow. did get the chance to visit see some of my, my siblings in January of this year, mm. just for a couple of which were an hour, you know, but yeah. But uh, alhamdulillah, you know, hopefully... I have to bring you over to the East Coast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or we do the opposite, bring you here, you know. So we spend I, I, well, I'm, 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 well, we're going to be in California a couple of weeks, inshallah. <laughs> inshallah, okay, inshallah. We need to talk about that afterwards, you know. But, um, <laughs> but Sheikh Yasser, um, uh, I wanted to uh, begin starting, uh, to start uh, the, the conversation about you in particular. You're like, you know, what, you know, I wanted to talk about, like, what's your journey and you know, some background about your family, your upbringing, uh, your journey to the study of Islam, a scholarship and the things that you're doing. And of course, eventually we'll make it uh, to hopefully talk about the prophetic living as well. Right. You know, but we can sort of leave that, you know, but right now when, a, you know, perhaps, you know, who is Sheikh Yasser Fahmi? Who is Sheikh Yasser Fahmi? Um, you know, whatever you think is appropriate. You know, we'd like to hear what that is. Uh, barakallahu fikum. Um, I'm, you know, uh, in no false humility. I'm really not that interesting, but uh, if you insist, um, I uh, I was born and raised in um, in uh, northern New Jersey. Hmm. So I'm, uh, you know, I kind of uh, experienced much of the 80s and 90s as my the fundamental upbringing that I had uh, hmm. here in in the West. And um, I, you know, I was born into a family in particular with my parents and my father who um, were really committed to Islamic work. Um, and I say that because it kind of, it really does color uh, so much of who I am today. And, you know, I, I took it for granted growing up. I just kind of took it as a given, you know, that, you know, I was a part of uh, a home where, um, you know, establishing masajid in Islamic schools and so on was just something we did. Mm -hmm. or my family was invested in and an active uh, participant within. Mm -hmm. But then I realized, you know, how much of a bubble I was in <laughs> and how unique that was. And I, I don't say that to brag or to speak of myself mm -hmm. in any self-aggrandizing terms. It's just a blessing that I truly thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I remember my, my father tells a story that when I was born, you know, he had a meeting at the house. And he told the, the brothers in the meeting, he said, listen, I'm just going to go give birth to this kid. I'm going to come back. Don't break the meeting. You know, <laughs> just keep it going. <laughs> so that really is kind of just to give you a flavoring, yeah. Yeah. Um, myself and my, my seven siblings. Yeah. Um, that's the world that we, we were raised in. And um, I, I think for the most part, I did grow up in a Muslim bubble, mm. which is also another unique thing. You know, it, it exists, but I didn't realize that you know, I only really had Muslim friends mm. and Muslim acquaintances um, for the overwhelming majority of my upbringing mm -hmm. um, in the northern New Jersey area here until uh, until I went to Catholic school. Mm 
so it was interesting that my father, who was the founder of the first Islamic school here, and one of the founders mm. of the first Islamic school here, he he decided for a number of factors to send us to a really rigorous all boys uh, Jesuit Catholic school. M my, myself and my brother Muhammad, just the wow. two of us. <laughs> yeah, and so I, in in Catholic school, it really was an eye opener for me. Um, I think in Catholic schools, I mean, up until that point. Uh, Islam was just something I was, something I did. You know, mm -hmm. I wasn't particularly, you know, motivated to serve the way my father was. Mm -hmm. I wanted to play video games and, you know, just hang out like the rest of us, watch, mm -hmm. watch the Fresh Prince of Bel, Bel Air and stuff like, <laughs> like everyone else, you know, in the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, uh, but then uh, when I went to Catholic school, and this was obviously in a pre-9-11 world, mm -hmm. in the, you know, early to mid-90s, mm -hmm this is the first time I was ever asked why I'm a Muslim or what does it mean to be a Muslim or, mm -hmm. you know, why don't you do certain things? Why don't you have a girlfriend? Why don't you this? What's, mm -hmm. What is your theology? Like, what is your Iman? What is your theology? Like, tell us about this. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I ended up probably at that time studying more um, about Catholicism and having more scriptural study in the Bible than I did with the Quran. You know, I had mm -hmm. a very remedial engagement with the Quran and, and, you know, just through my father and Islamic school, Islamic study, you know, we can't, you know, Saturday, Sunday school, but then I'm in Catholic school, Jesuit Catholic school, which by the way, the majority of my teachers were professors. Jesuits mm -hmm. are very serious about their mm -hmm. academic training. And so I was doing like, you know, <laughs> detailed analytical scriptural studies in my high school years, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that, so that just put me in this space of, you know, engaging my own personal tradition in a far more rich and meaningful way because I was like, okay, here's what, you know, Catholics believe in, Christians believe in, mm -hmm. here's their theology. I remember our senior, my senior year in high school was just committed to the Trinity. Mm -hmm. the entire year analyzing and distilling the Trinity from like, you know, all of the historical uh, sources and secondary sources and so on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm like, well, I need to study Islam. I, you know, yeah. what does Islam say? What does Islam? What do we? What do I actually believe as a Muslim? Mm -hmm. So I think that coupled with, um, you know, people sometimes talk about like spiritual moments or experiences that right. you know, kind of kickstarted certain things. Mm -hmm. For me, <clears throat> a big, big moment. I think that's like the backdrop and the context. Mm -hmm. But a big moment that kind of propelled me into taking Islam like, very seriously from a devotional perspective was Etikaf. My mm. father, mashallah, may Allah bless him. Amen. His sunnah, I mean, he's been making etikaf last 10 nights of Ramadan, uh, sometimes last 20 days of nights of Ramadan. He's been doing that for uh, as far back as I can remember, easily mm. over 30 to 40 years, 35 Allah years. A lot preserving. I mean, you know, man, I, you, I think you, you, you've, yeah, you know him and you, <laughs> yeah, you know, that thing is interesting is that, um, the moment I realized you were his son, uh huh. It was just such an amazing, amazing moment. I, we were on Hajj. We, we made Hajj in 2015, I think it was. And we were in, um, in Arafat. As a matter of fact, there was a special, this is before the, uh, the actual day of Arafat. You know, this is prior to all of the, uh, everything starting, you know. So yeah, they yeah. had a special, somehow we had some sort of special uh, dinner, right, in mm -hmm. the, uh, at Arafat. And um, so we were talking. And he said something about, yeah, you know, like my, you know, my, my son, you know, my son, you know, he's a, an imam in Boston. I said, what, your son? I said, I know your son, you know. And then I looked at him and I thought of his name is Fikri Fahmi. I said, oh, I said, really? So I said, subhanAllah. I just sort of just, I blew up, you know, just such a, like an amazing moment. You know, I just, I, I should have known. So it connected the dots a lot earlier, you know, and there's, of course, there's some resemblance. And, and the thing about it too, is that I actually, met your father before i ever met you i believe right so because oh. because when i came home from overseas uh 2001 um i think maybe 2003 2004 um brother Gaydar and and others you know there's another brother i forget his name he was living in the uaa anwar but anwar you know they yeah. invited me to a program under an organization they started i think it was called the mishkat institute yep, yep, yep and and your father was there at the program mm -hmm. i think it was part of one of the organizers too and i remember an exchange we had at the end uh, during the q a se session so he asked this question about um you know i've been hearing a whole lot about like this problems between 
African Americans and immigrant Muslims for a long time. You know, his, mm -hmm. and his, so his question was like, how, what, do, what do I think? You know, uh, what do you think? Mm -hmm. you know we need to do in order to sort of like bridge that divide you know so and it really stuck with me that question and i remember the answer i gave too but but yeah so finalize is i just knew he was a very beautiful man and i i really took to him very early early on you know but sorry to you know cut you off but i no I, no 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 i love bless you i mean yeah. I, you know subhanallah i and i love bless him and, and my mother and and, and mm -hmm. you know the, mm. i can't tell you like the, the the stories that i have about people because my mm -hmm. father in in the northern New Jersey area, and then like in like nationally, but from like the old school crowd, not from the younger crowd. But uh, you know, I always I'll travel around and be in some random message, and an elderly, you know, I'm or uncle comes up and says, "Are you a Fikri son?" I'm like, "Yeah," and he's like, "Oh, please give him my salam." I met him in the '60s or the '70s. We we're together here. And then locally, he's I mean, his he's known as Amu Fikri. So right, right. I grew up. I grew up, and my father. You know, he, mashallah, until today, he runs many, many of his own personal halaqat. He's not a scholar, by the way, just for the audience. Right. He, he doesn't identify as a sheikh or an imam or anything. He's just a very sincere person who loves the Quran and he loves the seerah of the Prophet mm -hmm. and he loves people, you know, and he yeah. just kind of. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up in a, in, a, in a context where people come up to me, mm -hmm. like, for example, say, hey, listen, there's this great uh, halaqa that, you know, is run by Amu Fikri. He's this guy mm -hmm. you should try to attend. I'm like, yeah, inshallah, I'll do, you know, <laughs> I'll do my best. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> they don't know if you're being yeah, like, like, <laughs> like, I mean, right. probably people who've been through his halaqa are in the thousands. Mm. Like you mentioned Ghaidar and Arbor, these are all guys, mashallah. That, mm -hmm. May Allah bless him and, and bless him. Amen. So anyway, I, you know, um, so that Atikaf, my father, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I, because of Catholic school, um, we had Christmas off and our Christmas vacation was a month and a half. So it was mm. almost like a summer vacation. You know, so my mm -hmm. father, the years where uh, Christmas vacation and, Atik and Ramadan overlapped, my father, I remember I was in my sophomore year. He said, uh, he didn't really give me a choice. He said, you're coming to Etikaf with me. And uh, I remember in that time, you know, sometimes like right, right now you travel around Masajid in Ramadan and mashallah, like you see a, you, like, a nice vibrant youth presence Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I saw this like this past Ramadan, traveling all over the place. I was like, Mashallah, look at how many beautiful souls are here. Mm -hmm. We did. I did it in Toronto. I did a talk at you know uh, with Ikna with Isna uh, Canada, mm -hmm. and uh, it was like midnight or one a.m. There was like two thousand young people. Mm -hmm. I really, like, you, know, uh, you know, blew Maybe. my mind. Mm -hmm. But I grew up in a reality where it was like right. I was the only young person, and there was yeah. like ten or fifteen Amus mm -hmm. who were in the masjid, and uh, Amus and uncles in the masjid, and so. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, I uh, it was the most exhausting, the most. I mean, I was their gopher, so it's like go pick up, run, right, right. <laughs> clean, cook everything, like do everything to serve these. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, you know, Allah's my witness, and I, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for etikaf because it has it means something very personal to me. It, it mm -hmm. completely changed, you know, mm -hmm. it was a, it was a critical catalyst catalyst in just changing my attitude towards Islam, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, where. I kind of started to really internalize what I saw modeled in my father and my and my parents around, you know, Islam not just as something you 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 practice you practice or identify as, but something you are, something you live, mm -hmm. something to be served. Islam is not it's it's a, if you will a project, right. and you have to work at it every single day, and you have to serve it every day, and you have to serve the cause. And, you know, that was like a, it was a switch. I mean, I, you know, I, I think there was a lot of obviously context that built into that, but then I think I've just switched something into me that made it where, you know, at, at the end of high school, I decided that I wanted to uh, study Islamic studies. Um, I, and I, by the way, at that time, you know, I, I had, I knew that Imam Zaid was overseas. You know, mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't know you. Um, you know, right. I didn't really know people. It wasn't a thing. Like I didn't know people were studying overseas, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I just I knew you know the local sheikh we have Sheikh Tanani, mm -hmm. and you know some mm -hmm. of the people. And I was just like I just want to study this religion, you know. Mm -hmm. So locally, I had started to pick up on my Quran studies and Arabic, mm -hmm. Arabic language studies, and then and then I went to Jordan. So I went to Jordan um, in two thousand. Uh, 99, 2000. Mm -hmm. I went there because of the advice of of the local, you know, Sheikh Atani, the local Sheikh here, who's a PhD mm -hmm. in Jordan. Mm -hmm. 
but all the Egyptians like, what are you doing? You know, you're Egyptian. You have to go to Azhar. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know that's that's your. Uh, I, I, have, I have an Azhar story too. When you finish, right? Okay, <laughs> go yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I didn't get the Azhar yet, but we'll get, <laughs> right. like, that's definitely a big part of the story. But anyway, yeah. I um, yeah. and my grandfather is actually one of the uh, very well known shiuch of the Azhar Shabini, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. his uh, entire library was donated to the Azhar Library. So there's a big section oh, oh, with my, my, my great grandfather's. Uh, mm-hmm library but um so i went to jordan for a year mm-hmm. and um and that you know it was a beautiful experience it was rich it was tough you know it was tough as an american who had just graduated high school um i could tell you people were suspicious like what in the world are you doing here like this young american guy yeah. <laughs> coming to study islamic studies yeah. in jordan like yeah. people weren't buying it like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? and then when i returned the u.s was like what in the world were you doing over there? <laughs> so it's like uh, on both yeah. fronts, there's a lot of suspicion. Like what, you know? Right. Right. Uh, so you were there uh, for a year? So you were in Jordan for one year? I was in Jordan for a year. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I was in Jordan for a year. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, when I was there towards the end of that year, like a lot of the consultation with local students and just people who were like, listen, Jordan's not the place. Mm-hmm. You got to go to Egypt. I mean, mm-hmm. Jordan at that time, right now, it's a far more robust educational scene. Mm-hmm. At that time, you know, it was pretty sparse and barren. Um, you had a few scholars that were really like amazing, but then access was a challenge. It was just a, it was difficult, you know, to, to, to negotiate that as a, as a young student at that time. I mean, that's a whole other story, but mm-hmm. point being is I decided to make the transition to Al-Azhar. Mm-hmm. Um, but I ended up taking a, um, I would say it was like a, from the time I left Jordan to the time I made it to Azhar, Mm-hmm. was around like six years, six, seven years, because mm-hmm. when I came back, you know, I was told like, hey, listen, you got to you got to be thoughtful about your future and, mar- and all this stuff. And and being an imam and is not easy financially and, and mm-hmm. as a career. Yeah. So, so mm-hmm. I, you know, I was advised by many people like right. get a, I, I can I don't want to say their names, but some are known, some are others. Just get what they told me was a just in case. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard this, like, yeah, just exactly. in case, you know, and, and, and a lot of us can tell you this, like, just in case, you know, I have something to fall back on. So I literally went and got my just in case degree. Went to Rutgers, went to Rutgers Business School, got a degree in finance and business and finance. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you how you got into that. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, literally, I mean, just as I said, like, it was, I, I basically opened up the, uh, the you know, the, the you know, because I had taken my SATs in high school, so mm-hmm. and I had applied to all the universities I wanted to go to. I applied, I wanted to go to Columbia, and mm-hmm. I got accepted, but mm-hmm. um, I didn't do deferred enrollment to anything. I just kind of like I'm I'm going overseas to study. Oh, okay. So when I came back, I had to you know actually go through the process yes, of right. mm-hmm. uh, application enrollment. How did I got into? I was able to go to Rutgers. Imam Zaid went, and and there's a lot of uh, <laughs> you know, almost you know. Uh, I'm a mater. Like I'm a mater from there. So uh, anyway, ultimately. Um, you know, I, I went down this path. I got into, you know, business and finance because I just opened up the manual. I was like, this is the most practical thing I can get. Mm-hmm. You know, something that I can leverage in any space. So what's right. meaningful, this degree. That was it. That was really the thought process. Mm-hmm. 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 When I graduated, and I, by the way, I, you know, I finished my college degree at, I mean, I did 21 credits in spring and fall semesters. In the mm-hmm. winter semester, I did six credits. In the summer, I did 12. So I was just trying to be done with this be done, right yeah. that's why people at that time period they're like wait you were in rutgers at that like these years mm-hmm. i was like yeah like no. i was like yeah because i was never too bc i was just yeah, yeah. i was just school and then mm-hmm. back into the masjid or stuff like that i, I really didn't want to be right. i wanted to be done with it right right but uh so between between graduating from rutgers and the entrance exams into an azhar there was like seven months because i graduated in december the entrance exams were in october November. Mm-hmm. So my father was like, Hey, listen, you know, you have seven months, just get a job, you know, makes, you know, save some money so that you can, you know, have something to, you know, to fall back on in Egypt and stuff right. like that. Just, you know, it, it's not, it's yeah. not going to hurt. I was like, you know, good idea. I ended up getting a very good job in finance. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was in a venture capital firm uh, in Midtown Manhattan. You know, for those of you who know finance, it was like, Venture capital is one of the industries of finance alongside private equity and stuff like that. So I was in the venture capital comp- firm. Uh, it was in the medical health industry. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
you know, I, that, that ended up being from seven months to three, three, three and a half years. Oh, okay. okay. For a lot of, you know, life reasons and that we yeah. don't need to get into, but yeah. Yeah. Um, kind of just ended up being the case. So I, <laughs> I was a yeah, good experience, good experience, um, you know, learn quite a bit, good experience, you know, you learn quite a bit. It was a very rich experience. It was a very exhaustive and abusive experience. I mean, mm -hmm. I was out of the house by six thirty, seven thirty, back home at late night hours. It was just really, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I'll be honest, I was not, a happy camper. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I really was like, it was having an outer body experience on the regular. Like mm. I used to wear these big headphones just to kind of like disconnect and listen to mm -hmm. like lectures and durus while I'm <laughs> working mm -hmm. just because my heart was not in it. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, the money was great. Uh, I mean, it was yeah. really, really great. Uh, Usually the case, yeah. Huh? Usually the case. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I was just like, you know, I remember some house so the day, I just made the decision. It was literally, I was like, I need to leave. I, mm -hmm. You know, life events had kind of evolved in a certain direction. And I was just like, you know what? It's time to make the decision to go and do what I've been planning to do for the past many years. And I went, I walked to my Fred, uh, my boss, Fred. Uh, and he was, and I told him, hey, Fred, listen, I'm, you know, I'm going to quit and, and uh, go overseas to study Arabic and Islamic studies. <laughs> Now this was this was post 9/11. So he's like, "Listen, I know you're not a terrorist." <laughs> I swear. So that's the first thing he said to you. Huh? <laughs> I know you're not. He's like, uh, "So I don't know what kind of early onset life crisis you're having, where you need to like get something out of your system, because no one walks away from money like this. So just go get out of your system for a year and come back." And I'm, not, I'm, you know, I'm going to keep your position for you because I, you know, I want you back. No, um, and then after a year, I sent him an email. I said, "Fred, I'm, <laughs> I'm good. I, I've never, right. I've never been happier. So I'm not, yeah, I'm not coming back." So that that started my my Azhar journey. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up spending around seven and a half, eight years in Egypt. All mm -hmm. in all, mm -hmm. um, Azhar was the actual like process of getting into the university and finishing. Mm -hmm. It was around five years. Mm -hmm. And then I spent an extra two and a half years studying with Mashayikh. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, we can, we can, I don't know if you want to pause there. We can get into No, 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 that's no, fine. Yeah, no, yeah. Go, yeah, go right. I mean, so that's, that's how I basically, you know, that was my road to Al-Azhar. And then Egypt was just a whole other world of transformation for me personally, in terms of my journey in life and my purpose and, uh, uh, pursuits and just my, you know, the, the my ufuk, my horizons expanding in terms of what Islam is. Um, right. You know, I think I, I had a very rudimentary understanding of things at a, such a superficial level about our tradition, um, very myopic at times. And then, you know, and, uh, you know, the, the war, the, you know, the, 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 the Aqidah wars of the 90s, and like, you know, that backdrop of like, you know, this ideological tilt, whether you're like Salafi, Sufi, Ikhwani, whatever, <laughs> that was a lot of the backdrop that, you know, kind of colored things for me at times. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I was I was never personally staunchly rooted, you know, in any one circle. I was just kind of like I remember at that time, like having a play, you know, well, there wasn't playlists, but I had like tapes. I mean, everyone had Imam Salaj tapes. Mm -hmm. in the 90s and stuff like that but I, mm -hmm. I remember having like something for Sheikh Hamza and something for like uh, Jamal Din Zorobozo and I was just like just like weird right. like combination of things I was, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> I was like yeah. on every side uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, and then like Egypt you know just being in Azhar being in the ulama of Azhar just mm. I mean it was like the veils were lifted and I was like wow I was just dumbfounded mm -hmm. by the depth the breadth mm -hmm. sophistication the history, the civilizational output, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I, I just felt like I was just an infant trying to learn how to crawl then, then walk. And, uh, and that, you know, so that, that journey was profoundly enriching. And uh, I mean, I, I say this and sometimes my wife doesn't like to hear this, but I say it's like, you know, the best time of my life by far. I, I said that publicly in a lecture and she was like, well, how about us? I was like, you know, it's, I was like, listen, you know, don't take it personally. It's like me saying Hajj was the best experience of my life. You know, I take offense to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so me being with like, with those to love with those students of knowledge and, and the beautiful thing about Azhar and I, and I, I know Morocco has a flavoring this as well. Mm -hmm. where you studied, but like 
you know, just the internationality of it. Like, you know, mm. studying alongside students from every walk of life. Right. Yeah. Socioeconomic, cultural, you know, regional. I mean, my best classmates and friends were, you know, students from like the villages of Mali and Senegal. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Same here. That, you Same know, here. blew my mind yeah. 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 with their brilliance and their intellect. Mm. They're like piercing, piercing mm -hmm. intellect and just depth of knowledge and, you know, awareness of like thousands of texts. Uh, they can recall, recall capabilities that were, I, I mean, I, I was just, you know, Don't beyond myself, you right. know, right. students yeah. from North Africa, students from the Caucasus, you know, from Uzbekistan. Mm -hmm. Uzbekistan and, and, and so I just being in that world yeah. and, you know, I, I just feel like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless me beyond measure. I mean, I personally, I mean, I'm, I'm you know, once again, none of this is self-aggrandizing or mm -hmm. but I just felt like I am blessed to be here. I'm yeah. blessed to be around yeah. these individuals yeah. and to yeah. and to learn from them because I was learning. I was learning from everyone. I was learning from the teachers and I was learning from the students. And I, I would argue at times I was learning from the students more than the teachers, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because sometimes sometimes the teachers, you know, so maybe a little bit of a job for them, right, especially yeah. if you're in the university campus setting. Mm -hmm. When you're outside and you have like a sheikh, a scholar, it's a very different reality. But then with the students and you see you see their adab, you see their convictions, you see their commitment, you see their seriousness about study. Uh, and, and you see how they did not take one second for granted being there. Because a lot of them, or a good number of them, this was like a... It was a, a one-way trip with the potential of a return trip sometime down the line because there was no resources, you know, to travel back and forth. I was, you know, as an American, I was traveling back every summer, visiting my family, whatever. These students, they wouldn't see their families for, without exaggeration, 10 years. Yeah. yeah. Them 15 years. They didn't see any of the, they didn't, they didn't go back to their village once. Yeah. Because there was only one possible return for them, which is when right. they're done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I just, you know, so it's like, how are we living the same reality? <laughs> you know, it's, you yeah. know, and we're classmates and I'm studying and we're sharing notes and, uh, you know, and, and I'm thinking to myself, man, I mean, what are we as America? Like, I, I just, you know, I was having these existential moments. Like, right. am, who am I? <laughs> you know, yeah. what does it mean to be an American Muslim? Because you, you know, you grow up as a, as a Muslim in the West and you can easily fall in. Mm -hmm. To a delusional state of grandeur and and mm -hmm. exceptionalism and, and intelligence and know-how and sophistication and comportment and and the fact of the matter is <laughs> it's far from that. It's yeah, right. That right, right. Times. Yeah, well, you know, you, you come to a realization of your privilege, <laughs> as you would say, right? You know, how much privilege you have, and and, and, then, and then also this the level of sabr and shukr that, you know, yeah. the others, you know, I mean, they endure a lot, but they're also grateful. They're happy people despite it all, right? You know, yeah. and we can have so much where we're still so unhappy, right? You know, but uh, yeah, yeah, I had similar experiences like that. You know, I mean, I, you know, I'm talking, CD from the perspective of like, even mm -hmm. from the, so from that perspective, 100%, yeah. but also yeah. from, from more, more specifically from the perspective of mm -hmm. the brilliance. Yes, right. The intelligence. Mm -hmm. um okay so the, the 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 and and like their the civilizational output like the culture mm -hmm. the practices yeah. um you know that also impacted me deeply mm -hmm. to see like you know when you compare and contrast cultures and practices yeah. and habits mm -hmm. and i'm just like this one on this level is far more superior than what i'm accustomed to right you know this these particular habits these particular practices mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. those the way of thinking about in, in terms of like marriage and, and children and family mm -hmm. um you know the, the way they would speak about their villages mm -hmm. and you know i don't i don't have a village that i speak of. like you know yeah. i don't i don't have a commitment to a people right you know the way that these individuals are sp right. speaking about like their commitment to their people and so there's a lot mm -hmm. of that, that when i say like they taught me i mean that i learned you know, beyond the room, I, mm -hmm. I learned culture, I learned, you know, civilization, I learned things that mm -hmm. I feel like we are at a tremendous loss of mm -hmm. here. Right. Um, and, and so that's, that's just where I feel like constantly, like I said, my, my horizons were expanding, right, beyond right. measure. Um, and, I, and I imagine that has something to do with uh, you eventually developing uh, the prophetic living, um, this, uh, 
Institute yeah. uh, that you're you've been working on, you know. So I, because that's what it sounds like to me, you know, that 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 all of that experience went into what 100%. you're trying to do right now with that, you know. Why don't you speak a little bit about that? I mean, I was going to say something about my own experience. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's, let's hear. No, no. Let, let's hear about right. that. No, no, no. It's okay. It's, it's about. Want, yeah. Listen, yeah. We're, we're, we have all the time. I want to hear about your experience. It's brief. It's brief. It was just basically that, you know, prior to actually going to a Karawiyin. Yeah, actually, um, I was I was actually on my way to Azhar, you know, oh. but I but I was yeah I wasn't actually accepted into Azhar, you know. So I had a plan. My plan was I was going to go to Egypt. I was going to walk up to Azhar, knock on the door, and say, "Hey, I'm here to study." All right, you know. So there are some brothers in the in the city in Philadelphia where I was living there, you know, who bought a one way ticket for me, right? You know, because um, you know people were pushing me to go overseas to study. You know, some people mm -hmm. say you used to go to you used to go to Medina. You know, oh, they used to go to oh, sorry. You could, and they kept changing their minds, you know. And mm -hmm. I was like, I'll go wherever you guys tell me to go, right? <laughs> so then finally, uh, one group of older brothers they decided, okay, we're going to buy them a one way ticket and send them over, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so I my plan was was that I'm going to go there. I'm serious, lila. I'm going to knock on the door, and then that's it. I'm going to become a student like that, you know. But the day before I was supposed to leave, there was one of those brothers came to me. And begged me not to go. Right, not he. He was. He wasn't one of those who actually purchased the ticket. Mm -hmm. But it was a different brother who was actually pushing me to go study overseas. You know, so it took him about an hour to convince me because I was like, I was dead set on going. Yeah, I said, listen, I'm going. Lila, yeah, I'm going to make it. Don't worry about it. You know, it's a brother. You're going to starve. You have no, no support. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, so alhamdulillah, you know, eventually I just decided not to go. And so, and then I went to university. I went to Temple for two years. I was majoring okay. in. Uh, I was majoring in computer science. Mm. Um, and then eventually I found the Arabic section of the library. And then that's when I went back to the idea of trying to find somewhere to go overseas. And then when I spoke with Dr. Khalid Lancashire, it was his idea. Okay, oh, we'll go to Qatarayin. We don't know if anyone oh, actually, wow. got, actually studied there. You know? So that's how that all happened. You know? so, I didn't know that, subhanAllah. Dr. <laughs> Khalid was your, the reason yeah. for you going to Qatarayin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. MashaAllah, right. that's beautiful. That's yeah. beautiful. May Allah bless him and increase him. Ya Rabbi, he's a... He's a gift to this only yeah, I mean, totally, totally. all of our teachers. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, so, so you've been an imam, you know, before in Boston, yeah. you've done some other things, yeah. you know, but like we do have this project called prophetic living, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, so yeah. prophetic living was birthed out of, I mean, I think what you said is very astute and, and critical. It was birthed out of that experience, but it was also the experience of when I came back to the U S in 2013, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I kind of, uh, you know, I had I had a path to go into academia. Mm -hmm. My wife, she she did her PhD at Harvard, and I was thinking like, you know, I want to do academia as well. But Allah Subhanahu wa Taala literally derailed every plan for me to go down the academic path. Uh, Good for you. Good, huh? for you. Good for you. <laughs> yeah, Subhanallah. I mean, it's just I, I mean that's a story in and of its own, yeah, yeah. and it's a name. Uh, you know, I I you know I. I Anyway, I took my GREs. I did everything. I met with all the professors like mm -hmm. from all the major universities. And I was like a shoe in here, shoe in there, whatever. But then I never, this life thing happened where I never made the application. I had to postpone mm -hmm. for a year, blah, blah, blah. And then it just, mm -hmm. you know, but anyway. Um, so I, 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 you know, subhanAllah, I ended up just going into, I would say, the default route of being an imam. Mm -hmm. um, and that was something that for all those years in Egypt, I'm like, you know, I'm not going to go back and be an imam. You know, I, I met with so many people over the years and I had a lot of close relationships with different individuals. I became very close to Dr. Sherman Jackson when I was in Egypt. Mm -hmm. He was developing the Islamic law program at the AUC come in the summer. So we would hang out, you know, for, mm -hmm. mashallah, beautiful hangouts and, uh, and have tea and, and food and falafel and stuff like that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, so I, in my mind, I'm like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not cut out to be an imam. I don't want to take that route. Mm -hmm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, like, categorically, you're going to be an imam. Mm -hmm. So I started off when I moved back here in New Jersey. I was an imam in the local masjid here. Mm -hmm. And then I, I moved on to take the position in Boston. I was there for um, around f five, six years. And when I left the masjid in Boston, um, you know, I, I had a moment of just kind of self-reflection because that Boston undertaking was a huge project and it was a lot. I mean, I invested my heart and soul into that space, mm -hmm. and I was mm -hmm. I was doing nothing pretty much other than eat, drink, sleep. You know, yeah, the, the masjid in Boston, and then mm -hmm. you know, kind of I, I transitioned out, and it was a tough time. 
on many, many levels. But so, but it just kind of led me to think about all this work that I've been doing. You know, what am I doing? What does it mean? Uh, what does it mean to be doing dawah in the modern period? Like, what's this? I mean, I felt like I had this overwhelming feeling that everyone's moving at 100 miles per hour, mm-hmm. you know, in their jobs, you know, as imams or in production of content, you know, stuff, the, the whole internet reality obviously was yeah, full, right. you know, full force. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I just, I was thinking to myself, like, what does this all mean vis-a-vis like the average Muslim who's just trying to practice their religion, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, and, 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 you know, just, so taking all that, I ended up writing like a, uh, is many pages, but just kind of reflection, something mm-hmm. for myself thinking mm-hmm. about where are the major gaps in the American Muslim landscape? Like what's mm-hmm. missing from the equation? Because it, it, we don't have a shortage of content that's produced mm-hmm. and that's out there in the ether, but there seems to be a massive sh- gap between the content, like the ilm and the amal, like the practice, right? Yeah, and the right. average Muslim, because at the end of the day, it's just like an average Muslim was going on the internet and like, you know, whatever, like, you know, mm-hmm. like a... Uh, like a Netflix thing, like just finding, okay, I'm interested in listening to this. I'll listen to this lecture or get caught up in like, you know, the algorithms that feed you a lot of like sensational back and forth, you know, that kind of stuff. And but I'm like, I don't, I don't. so I just felt in, cause even in my experience as an imam in the masjid, although it was beautiful and rich and we had, you know, people were coming and we had classes, but then I would sit in my office and people would come and say, I feel lonely. Mm. Um, I, I feel like, I'm around a lot of people, but I just don't feel like I have, yeah. like, I feel like that I'm loved or that I'm cared for. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and this stuff would, you know, it just sit in my mind. I'm like, what? like we just, we had a halakha and there was like right. 400 people, whatever, <laughs> 500, 400. Mm-hmm. And you feel lonely? I don't like, mm-hmm. and so I, I realized that, you know, there's something missing. You know, there's something missing in the equation mm-hmm. of how we're doing Islam in America, like how we're actually yeah. like, practicing and living out this reality. So prophetic living was birthed out of all these experiences to say we need a space that's very intentional. A space, by a space, I mean, it could be, you know, space, I mean, just philosophically, but it could be a physical, it could be whatever. But we need, we need uh, people who are focused on real intentionality, real community and, and sincere development, Mm-hmm. You know, and that is that, like, you know, myself, yourself, whatever, we're, 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 we're living here together, let's say, in Northern California, Northern Jersey, and we just, we really want to, we really want to figure out what it means to live like the Prophet Muhammad. Like, what does that pathway look, what's the look and feel of it? What mm-hmm. are the habits, the practices, you know, the, the, the routines? Because Islam is a lived reality. It, it's, it's, it's real, it's visceral, and it's ubiquitous. It's in everything we are. Like how, Mm -hmm. how, okay, we all have these careers, we have these, uh, you know, academic exploits, we have families, we have, you know, we consume stuff on our phones all day. But how do I, like, is how, what percentage of, is of my identity actually prophetic? Right. Like I can say like the prophetic quotient in my career pursuits are really prevalent, present, present and apparent rather than just being like lip service. Like, yeah, yeah, my intentions for Allah or something, you know, which is like, we kind of lob out, we throw out this like thing of like, yeah, yeah, my intentions for the sake of Allah, I'm going to go down and become X. Mm-hmm. Well, really? Like, what does that mean? What does it mean to be for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Mm-hmm. So, you know, I've, you know, so prophetic living is, is, is an, it's really an initiative at developing intentional um, communal spaces because a part of the thesis of prophetic living is that Islam is not actually something that practically speaking um, has been done in isolation. Right. Exactly. Today we try to practice Islam mm-hmm. in isolation. Yeah. You know, and it's, and as you know, CD, historically that was the, that was, those were the awliya who were able to accomplish mm-hmm. that. Right. Like the awliya lived in isolation yeah. and thrived spiritually in isolation. Yes. Yeah. As simpletons, we try to, Practice yeah. Islam in isolation, and it's yeah, it's not really a thousand talks about dhikr and a yeah. thousand talks about mm-hmm. praying to Hajjul and Qiyam at night, mm-hmm. and practically speaking, <clears throat> when is it happening and how is it happening? And yeah. I'm not I'm not here to like yeah. you know, beat down on us. It's just a there's some diagnosis yeah. that's required because when you look historically, you see well. Hold on, from day one the project was deeply communal in nature, yeah. meaning that 
your entire welfare, whether it's economic, spiritual, emotional, familial, whatever, is actually tied into, you know, a community. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was, I was on your website uh, earlier today, uh, Prophetic Living, and I went to the Our, Our Purpose page. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I, this first paragraph, I wanted to read it. Yeah. Uh, because I think it's, it sort of brings out some of what you just stated, you know, so it says a uh, prophetic living aims to develop thriving Muslim communities who follow the footsteps of our beloved prophet Muhammad mm -hmm. and center their lives around Allah through knowledge, worship, practice, service, and companionship through the intentional cultivation of prophetic lifestyles and communities. We strive to build strong foundations and practices to counter the modern trends of secularism and hyper individualism that leaves so many thirsty for spiritual nourishment. You know, so that, that came to mind when I was listening to you speak uh, and and it, it reminded me of the, the fundamental, uh, what seems to be a fact of like the difference between what we can call sort of new world co culture as opposed to old world culture, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and that sort of that disconnect or that sense of alienation that so many people seem to still feel seems to have a lot to do with the fact that they or we grow up in this Western culture yeah. uh, or the secular culture, we like to call it your hyper individualistic culture, you know, and yeah, because an entire family can be in the home and everyone's using a device yeah. right nowadays, right? You know, everybody's has a phone or iPad, you know, or has a television on. It's not enough, a, a whole lot of interaction. Mm -hmm. And how often do we actually spend time trying to get into one another's heads to yeah. try to really see what's really going on, if there are any needs, any emotional needs, psychological needs, yeah. you know. So, so yeah, I definitely um, do, uh, you know, uh, think that this is an extremely important project. And, you know, my lost friend, I said, grant you to feed and magnify, I'm, magnify the benefit from it. Sure. Uh, and, 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 and subhanAllah, you know, <laughs> you know, just connecting dots between my experiences and this, you know, it's mm. a lot of us now because we've been habituated into these like isolated identities, mm -hmm. we actually find it hard to interact with people. Like we, you know, we find community challenging and like, oh, I just, you know, I, I, it's safe for me to be alone because I don't want to have to deal with this or whatever. Whereas viscerally, we all need, we need people. Like, so we're thirsting and crying out for people, attention and relationships and bonds and connections. But then we find it difficult because our muscles have, you know, have waned. We, we you know, we, we have withered away. We don't, we don't actually, the communal muscle has weakened. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll, you know, it's a very funny but poignant experience that when I first moved to Egypt, and I remember sitting in one of my like first majalis of ilm, mm -hmm. um, it was an azhar, and I walked in and I sat down, and then this Egyptian student came, and he literally was like so close to me that I, I, I could, you know, feel his breath on my neck and ear, like it was just this close, and he has his notebook out, and he's like looking, and he's leaning on my back, right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm, I'm an American, right? So I'm like, <laughs> what do I want? I'm to fight. What's happening there? So, so I'm like, I need, like, I want my space. I want like a foot, two feet in every direction. Like my personal space, right? That's, that's a very American way to feel and think. Right. And of course, like I'm just sitting there and, and like everyone's squished together and this guy is, mm. and, and so I look at him and I kind of like, as if I'm expecting him to understand what I'm saying. I'm telling him, hey, listen, can I just have, he's like, like, What's the, what do you want? You know, he's kind of like he's trying to focus on the class, and yeah. and I'm more concerned about hey, can you just give me like some space, yeah, some space. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 those are those moments mm. kind of like you know they 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 open up something in your if you go mm. home and think about it, like mm -hmm. you know he was so comfortable, it was so matter of fact. He's there, he's there to study. You you. And you look at our tradition, our tradition is always about like get closer, you know, get closer together. Mm -hmm. Hold on, like, right. you know, bring the lines together. Mm -hmm. uh, sitting in the majalis, get closer, Cl fill up the gaps, fill up the gaps. Isn't that our tradition? Right. You know, right. And, mm -hmm. and that's how I think about community today, because yeah. if we don't learn mm -hmm. that we have actually developed really bad habits about how we think and feel about community, how we mm -hmm. think and feel about people. And we're just we're, we're, the collective suffering will maintain because mm -hmm. everything about our about our tradition tells us yet Allah Like mm -hmm. the aid and the support of the divine is with the group. Like when you are with Allah, when you're with the group, then and you're nestled within them, mm -hmm. and you hold on to the rope collectively, then that's your 
you know, your strong handhold of salvation. But if you, if we continue to live in isolation, then we will continue to suffer. Yes. Emotionally, right. spiritually, um, financially. You know, you were mentioning earlier, how, how are people supposed to help each other if they barely know each other? I, if you don't really know what I'm going through. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I have no doubt that the overwhelming majority of humanity, not just Muslims, are good people. Meaning that if they really know that someone's close to them is struggling, mm -hmm. and it means like they'll be the first one, like, hey, bro, here, take this, help this. Like, I got you. I'll take care of it. I can, what do you need? Right. But we, we don't even make ourselves, you know, mm -hmm. vulnerable enough to be known and right. then to be, to have others invested in us. Yeah. And, and we're not doing it, obviously, for others. And so, you know, this is why for me, you know, my team always talks about like you couldn't have chosen like a more <laughs> like an easier project. Like you know, you can just pump out <laughs> like you can give lectures and talks. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, <laughs> like have, yeah. yeah. It's listen. There, I, I mean, communal work is. I'm, I'm yeah. sure as you know, it's the so, hard, mm -hmm. hard, hard work, right? Mm -hmm. But if I'm gonna be honest, I said to myself, I've always said like I don't. And if you, I, I'm never gonna do something just for the sake of doing it, right? Alhamdulillah, when it comes to content production, mm -hmm. mashallah, you know, you have your publications. Mm -hmm. You have everyone, like mashallah, so much knowledge that's being pumped out. That's relevant. That's necessary. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, obviously, the Islamic library is always mm -hmm. open for more. Mm -hmm. But then we have to think a bit more strategically, right? Who's mm -hmm. doing the communal work, right? right. Who's doing the, and, and by communal work, I don't just mean by imam of the masjid. Because that's, yeah, right. to me, that's a, that's a role. That's a responsibility. It's important. I'm not dismissing it. But I mean, like, we need now institution building, yeah. just as we have, like, you know, we're, we're building out Masajah, we're building out academic institutions, we're building out, like, publishing companies, and these are all relevant and critical for mm -hmm. the mosaic. Right. But there's, like, that that real nitty-gritty, like, hard-hitting communal work, which is, like, taking real people and making a real transformation. If you think of, like, Darul Arqam, like, that's mm -hmm. where the ethos, I think, of prophetic living orbits. Wallah. Right, mashallah. Yeah, I like to say sometimes that the best way to, or perhaps even the only way you can actually understand, fully understand another person's culture is that you have to give up part of which, uh, part of who you are. Mm. You know? In other words, uh, like, I mean, like your, your moment about the guy back, leaning on your back. I had a moment like that in Morocco when one of my friends, we were standing out in public, he grabbed my hand. We were holding hands in public. <laughs> I was like, hold on, I'm looking around trying to take, hold on, anybody notice this? Because <laughs> if, if it was in Philly, if it was in Philly, that would have been a problem. <laughs> yeah, been over, right? <laughs> so, like, yeah. Yeah, so, so Shay, you don't have any any publications, any translations in the words? No, I, I have, you yeah. know, I have a lot of stuff on the back end, nothing on the front end. Um, no, Michelle. Inshallah, when the time is right. and. Michelle. I feel that it's suitable, then maybe some things will come out, inshallah. Yeah, inshallah, yeah. Well, I'm, I actually, you know, I could talk to you all day, you know, but yeah. I want to I I respect your time. You know, of course, I mean, stories, you know, storytelling is extremely important. You know how powerful storytelling can be. Yeah. And, and, you know, so we've learned um, a bit about you. I mean, uh, hopefully your audience, you know, I've learned um, from, from this. Um, is there anyone that you in particular believe um, is not given his or her due, right? Uh, who actually has had an impact on your life, or um, you know, or just in general, someone you think that more people need to know something about, um, who you think could inspire them to be better people, right? You know, it could be one of your teachers, it could be someone from the past, from the present. You know, who would? Is there anyone that comes to mind when you think about that? Question? You know, uh, so. I mean, I, I, I would be dismayed if I didn't just on a personal level mention the sheikh who I think had so much to do with my personal development and growth. And there was many that, mashallah, I was blessed to, to be impacted by from really all walks of life. Mm -hmm. But one in particular that I must highlight, Sheikh Ahmed Rayyan, that's why he's in my bio. Mm -hmm. Sheikh Ahmed Rayyan, rahmatullah, he passed away around two years ago now. Um, you know, he, uh, you know, for me, he modeled um, what it looked like and felt like to be a Muslim, a real Muslim. And, you know, I, I, you know the, the famous statement of you know, the, uh, of Imam, you know, when Imam Malik's mother told her, when, you know, going to say, take from his comportment before you take from his knowledge. Right. You know, that was Sheikh, Sheikh Rayyan for me. Sheikh Rayyan is also like Sheikh al-Malikiyah. He was like the Sheikh al-Malikiyah in, mm -hmm. in that region. And uh, and he was a man of like impeccable adab, and I don't mean my adab just being like polite and kind. I mean just 
I learned how to pray, although I had prayed for decades, I had learned from how to pray by just watching him pray. Mm -hmm. I learned how to make dhikr by watching him make dhikr. I mm -hmm. learned how to study a book by watching him study a book. I learned how to teach by watching him teach. I mean, we were, when we were we were studying Sharh al uh, mm -hmm. I was studying with him, you know, in the masjid where Sheikh al is buried. Mm -hmm. And, and Sheikh, for those who are listening, Sheikh Sharh al is one of the seminal mm -hmm. texts in the Maliki madhab. And uh, <coughs> it's a very specialized text. And so sometimes, without exaggeration, it would be Tuesday at three o'clock or after us. And I'm, without exaggeration, sometimes there'd be four or five people there, sometimes mm -hmm. six. And I'll tell you, see, the, I, he would walk in always dressed impeccably, always dressed impeccably. One of the reasons why I take my Islamic dress very seriously. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I always dress, mm -hmm. you know, and I, 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 now I have taken, all, I've bought a lot of Moroccan because uh, <laughs> the good thing about see, the, <laughs> Moroccans are generous mm -hmm. because they have so many choices. Azhar is like, yeah. one choice? The Jumra, <laughs> I remember, but like, I'm Moroccan. <laughs> fill your wardrobe. Mm -hmm. But also, Morocco has a special place in my heart. But I mean, my point is, he would walk him impeccable in his dress, sit down, and you would think he's teaching ten thousand people with mm -hmm. the seriousness and the commitment. He did not care. Sometimes his bigger classes, when he was teaching like Bukhari in Masjid Al Azhar, would have you know a couple hundred people, like them, or the, the the room would be packed, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it just didn't make any. You could tell it meant nothing to him, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and. And so he he colored you know so much of how I think about practice, you know obviously I I mean he is a big reason why myself I'm Maliki because you know mm -hmm. when I was choosing he kind of I knew he existed and, and you know, I was told by other shiuch that like the, the way you choose a madhab is that you have access to someone who can teach you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was you know the principal reason I took the Maliki madhab because he mm -hmm. was there. But um, so in terms of akhlaq and adam and so on, so I just would be remiss if I didn't mention him, but. Yeah. If you're thinking, if you want like someone who is more like known and, and I think someone who should be given far more attention um, in the modern era is, um, I think, Sheikh Mustafa Sabri. Mm -hmm. uh, Sheikh Mustafa Sabri, mm -hmm. I think, is someone that, you know, Muslims should be far more familiar with, especially Muslims who are living in the modern era. Uh, mm -hmm. He is the last um, one to hold the post of Sheikh al Islam in the Ottoman Empire. <laughs> uh, so he was the last one to hold that particular post. He was born in, in Turkey um, and he lived the majority or you know of his life or I would say more than half in Turkey and then until he was forcibly exiled um, because he <coughs> was someone who was staunchly engaging modernity. Um, mm -hmm. in a very rich and scholarly and political way as well. Like he was engaged on every front, if you will. And he, you know, was dealing with uh, Kemalism, like with the advent of Kemal at the Turk and the ideologies and philosophies that were governing that. Mm -hmm. And he famously said something that always stuck with me is that he says when, when he was in Turkey, you know, um, m modernism or like, you know, just the modern ideologies were taking hold through qahr, through force. Mm -hmm. Whereas when he came to Egypt, he found that modern ideologies were being taken, were taking, or were taking hold, but through just, through ease. Persuasion. Huh? Persuasion. Yeah. Persuasion, I was going to say. Persuasion, yeah. culture, you know, yeah. uh, you know, just being obs obsessed with the West and that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah. So, but on both fronts, he was like, you know, uh, <laughs> working tirelessly to negotiate. Mm -hmm. All of these modern philosophies that um, had taken hold of, of of many of these countries, and uh, you know the, the Muslim, much of the Muslim or pockets mm -hmm. of the Muslim world, and so his book Mawqif Al Aql Wal Ilm Wal Alam Al Rabbil Alamin, like the, the the position of the mind, the rational, the Aql, mm -hmm. and the knowledge, and the scholar from Allah and His chosen messengers, mm -hmm. or you know this book to me, it's four volumes. It um, it speaks to my soul in a very rich way. I mean, if people want to understand a little bit about what colors my personal <laughs> philosophy and outlook mm -hmm. on things, you know, it's it's uh, I I love how profoundly relevant his analysis. It's rooted in brilliant academic uh, rigor, um, mm -hmm. and he's engaging in real time, like the philosophies of and the philosophers that are dominant in his time. So he he he's you know born before the, you know, the turn of the, uh, the 
the century, the twenty, you know, the nineteenth century, and then he he mm-hmm. dies uh, around like mid like nineteen fifty ish, and he's and and he's born he's buried in Egypt in Cairo because that's mm-hmm. where he ultimately after going to Mecca, um, he ultimately lands in, in, in Cairo. But you know, I'll, you know, what's curious is, you know, the first time I ever saw his name or even knew he existed mm-hmm. was driving to Al Azhar. Mm-hmm. Because um, I would drive through the graveyards. If you've ever been to Al Azhar, you know it's like surrounded by massive graveyards, mm-hmm. and a lot mm-hmm. of these graveyards are lived in. A lot of the awliya and the ulama and even sahaba are buried in these like massive graveyards. Mm-hmm. And so I'm driving through, and then you know I would always see this like red placard on a wall that says, you know, Sheikh Al Islam Mustafa Sabri, and I just mm-hmm. you know you. When, when you're going through and everyone's like, you see shiuch, ulama, shiuch, 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 like the burial site of Sheikh so and so, you just, and then, you know, I, I, and then that name just like I would pass by it almost every day. Sheikh, mm. I, you know, one day just read the finer, fine, fine uh, print and it said like the last Sheikh al Islam of the Ottoman Empire. Mm-hmm. Then that just kind of took me down this path of learning so much more about him and then from my teachers and so. You know, I, I just, I, what I, what I really would hope is that people appreciate how um, steeped uh, he was in the sacred tradition, and he was someone who really, really, you know, was fighting a fight to preserve the sacred tradition in the modern era because the onslaught from ulterior philosophy, you know, alternative philosophies was was so intense. Mm-hmm. But he was just a stalwart, and, and I. I I cherish him for that. I may Allah have mercy upon him. And, you know, he, you know, and and there's so many stories to be said about like his his, his social life, his mm-hmm. political life, and his scholarly life. Mm-hmm. Um, when he moved to Egypt, Subhanallah, he was Sheikh al Islam. Okay, he would like be Sheikh al Islam. Mm-hmm. When he moved to Egypt, he ended up going to Al Azhar and going into the Waqf for the Turks, like anyone mm-hmm. else. And just right. sat there, and then like eventually people realize, hey, this kind of this guy's pretty serious and scholar. Then you know, time unfolded, and then you know it was known that oh, this is Sheikh Al Islam. So he was ultimately given a post. But, mm-hmm. but I, I think his book Mawqif Al Aql Wal Ilm Wal Alam is is for me like a very important book that has to be more familiar in the scholarly spaces. Allah. Mashallah, Mashallah, Barakallah, Fiq. That was a beautiful um, explanation, um, overview of the of uh, Sheikh Mustafa Sabri, and of course also your individual, your personal Sheikh, <coughs> Sheikh Taha, Ahmed Taha Rayyan, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have, have mercy on both of them. I mean, so, but, uh, Sheikh Yasser, before we close, I mean, is there, how can someone follow your your efforts, your work? Yeah, I mean, I don't have a personal uh, page or anything, but you can find most of, of what I do through Prophetic Living. So if you just, on YouTube, we have a Prophetic Living YouTube page, there's a Prophetic Living Facebook page. And I believe there's a Prophetic Living Instagram page. Um, and then there's the website, propheticliving.org. So if you just search for Prophetic Living on the different platforms, um, you should be able to find like most of what I do, inshallah. Inshallah. Wow, thank you, uh, Sheikh Yasser. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, no, hopefully you. this won't be the last time. No, we, never, inshallah. My, my pleasure. Anytime. It's always a pleasure and always an honor. Barakallah for having me. Inshallah. 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 Hopefully you enjoyed that episode. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel here on YouTube and Spotify. Looking forward to seeing you in the next episode. God willing. Peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.